what Joseph and Mary were going through. And as we look at Joseph's uh, dilemma here this morning, again, a difficult process that he had to go through. Let's look at the text itself in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1. It says, Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did, uh, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So we see it's a difficult opportunity, a dilemma. Uh, it's a difficult opportunity we see in verses 18 because, well, <clears throat> Joseph didn't know the end of the story. <coughs> he didn't know an angel was going to appear to him. He didn't really understand or maybe even believe his betrothed uh, wife not yet come together physically, three stages of the, of the Jewish ceremony, probably arranged at childhood that one day they would be married, having come to an official ceremony at a point in time, pledging themselves one to another. We, re, we think of that when we have communion because Ju, Jesus uses a metaphor from it when he says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. That's what Joseph would have said or something similar to it in that ceremony. It's not going to be the same until we actually come together as husband and wife. They wouldn't have seen each other much during this time, but again, Nazareth isn't a big community today. It was a, a very small one then. But uh, dealing with this issue of Mary and what her statement about the fact that she's pregnant and it's of the Holy Spirit. She's either lying or she's crazy, but either way, if she's really pregnant, this is not good. And uh, it becomes, we would say, a difficult opportunity for him. But uh, it's difficult because of the engagement situation. But again, we believe that God perfectly positioned Joseph just as he did uh, Mary. Uh, Joseph is in the center of God's will, trying to follow God's, uh, God's word. Uh, and even then, sometimes, like us, trying to do the best that we can, thinking that we're right in line with where God would want us to be, God throws us these difficult opportunities <laughs> And says, will you trust me, even when everything else doesn't make sense? Uh, what made it difficult, again, was that everything was altered in his plan. We're going to see that he was a righteous man, a just man. We'll talk about what that is in just a moment. But uh, again, that first part of the ceremony, they had come together. He was awaiting the time when they would stand under the chuppah. If you've ever been to a, a Jewish wedding ceremony, those four uh, bridegrooms are... Uh, Grooms that are holding a pole and a canopy over, and they stand under it, and they come under the covering of God and into a marriage relationship. That hadn't happened, but it's about ready. But still, what they went through previously was completely binding and legal, and therefore that's when he decides he still actually needs to legally divorce her at this point. Uh, it's difficult, a difficult opportunity because of, well, two things that Mary claimed. As we said, she claimed that she was pregnant. Luke's gospel, again, which is kind of Mary's version of what happened, is, uh, it says this in chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. The angel departed from her. So again, incredible faith uh, uh, in terms of Mary, because 
Again, she doesn't know the end of the story. She doesn't know how Joseph is going to take this. She probably could assume that he's not going to be real thrilled. She probably could assume that she, he may not believe her at all. She can assume that as she goes through life and has a child outside the context of marriage, that happens all the time now. It was a huge thing in that culture. Certainly her parents would put her out. She would bring shame not only to her family, her family's name, and the succeeding generations, but the entire village would be put to shame because of this incident. And all of this has to be rolling around in her 15 or 16 year old mind as she considers what the angel has said and she says hey I'm the handmaid in the Lord let it be done to me incredible faith but now the focus goes back to to Joseph uh, the second claim not only was she pregnant but the difficult part also was that she says it's of the Holy Spirit in fact she says the angel says this child's going to be the Messiah well a step further the angel says he's not just going to be the Messiah, and it's not just going to be this virgin miraculous birth, but he's also, did I mention he's God? He's the son of God, God come into the flesh. Uh, again, a lot for this young gal to take in as she explains to Joseph. And you can realize that, well, it's a difficult opportunity for him. But notice what he does. He decides on his own to quietly divorce her, and he does this because... Well, he's a righteous man, verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. A just man, what does that mean? Well, the NIV, again, gives us the thought, a righteous man. And this means a lot. It means that he's not just a good Jew who keeps the Torah and keeps the law of God. It means a lot more than that. He's a man of wisdom, of the wisdom literature. He follows what's in the scriptures. He's a man of integrity. It means what he says is just and kind and the way he treats others. It says a lot more than, I just keep the rules. Proverbs would describe Joseph in, in many ways as it mentions a righteous man, but just some of the ways in, the, in just a couple of the Proverbs. Proverbs 10 and 11. Verse 6, blessings are on the head of the righteous, men like Joseph. Verse 7, the memory of the righteous is blessed. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life. The labor of the righteous leads to life. The tongue of the righteous is like choice silver. But through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. The desire of the righteous is only good. And if you're familiar with Proverbs, it goes on and on. This is, this is a, uh, an incredible young man. Uh, again, handpicked by God, as well as Mary being handpicked as well. Because he was a, a just man, a righteous man, beyond someone that just keeps the rules of the day, all of this makes no sense to him because of his own relationship with the Lord. I mean, he's, he's doing everything right. He has a good relationship with the Lord. Uh, and now his, wor his world is completely falling apart. Why would God allow this to happen to him? The person that he's grown up believing he would marry, that he's watched and observed for many years, that he went through an official ceremony and in a sense are legally binding in terms of their relationship, that now she's either, well, she's a liar or she's a lunatic or something worse, and what she's saying, how can it possibly be true? It made no sense as well, not only because of his relationship with the Lord, but because, you know, well, his relationship with Mary and understanding her character. If, again, if we study her and think about her and her reaction to this news and how she lives her life, how she was hand-picked, by God, of all the women in the world that had been born to that time, she's the one that is going to raise the Messiah. Well, she had to be an incredible young lady, just to say the least. And this doesn't make sense, because Mary's not a lunatic. She's not a liar. So how does he square all of this? And you can imagine uh, his own heart uh, and what he's going through. We would think that... Um, uh, you know, there, there would be some emotion, some love going on in their lives and the anticipation of them coming together. And because he was a just man, because he probably loved Mary, notice what he decides. He decides to, well, to spare her public disgrace. He's going to put her away quietly because that's what the law required him to do. Now, again, he was a righteous man, but he wasn't a self-righteous man. 
He wasn't going to bring her out in the public square or in the city gate and announce it to everyone. I am divorcing her, and these are the reasons. She's pregnant. I have nothing to do with it. I maintain my righteousness. I will not allow my reputation to be soiled by something she's done. He would be very, very right in doing those things. But he's not self-righteous. He's a righteous man. He's not quick to judge. No, he ends up trying to do this in a way to show, well, he's trying to show mercy to her. It's bad. He doesn't want to make it uh, uh, any, any worse. He's not quick to judge, and he's not quick to act either. It's important that we have a righteousness through our relationship with Jesus Christ, but we don't become self-righteous, judgmental of others that maybe aren't like us, have the same things, have the same relationship, the same perspective on life. We need to be careful that we're, well, men like Joseph and women like Mary who have outstanding character and integrity but are not self, self-righteous. One of, the, one of the cool events that we got to participate in a few years ago, and we've got, gone a couple of times, is to go out to Waianae and help with what was called Jesus Loves You Waianae, and we've done them in Waimanalo and a few other places, and with a, a bunch of churches joined together. One of the <clears throat> and there's a lot of things that go on. There's a concert. There's lots of food given away, lots of clothing given away. But there's this cool uh, carnival for the, for the kids uh, during the day, and it's good. <laughs> they have some pretty good rides and stuff. And uh, they got all of that going on, a little stage and a sound system. Uh, and the idea then that everything is free. They've got plate lunches. They've got hot dogs. They've got cotton candy. They've got shaved ice. They've got face painting. You name it. They've got all this stuff going on. Uh, there uh, by the gym in Y and I, and kids are having a great time. Everything is free. Parents are some parents. Some have parents. Some don't. Some have grandparents. Some have just folks that have uh, brought them. Uh, they're having a good time. And then about every hour and a half, the carnival shuts down, and then then they have kids get up on the stage to minister to the other kids. Our kids or our youth group and the gals would get up and dance dance hula and share with the kids, and then. Francis Kamahele, who kind of runs the whole thing, Francis would get up and basically share the gospel with the kids who were very open to, to the Lord uh, and given an opportunity to respond and come to faith in Christ. But of course, grandma and grandpa and uncles and aunts and a few parents are there listening as well, and, and many of them come to know the Lord that day as well. Kind of then take them into the gym and kind of do a little bit of follow-up to give them some uh, things to read in the Bible and so forth, and and I'm there kind of helping with that aspect, <laughs> but um, I uh, I'm just kind of trying to I'm the supervisor. I'm just kind of overseeing, you know, you know the other folks and everything. If they have a problem, then I kind of jump in and everything, which they seldom do. And I was off to the side during one of those occasions, and I noticed a, a big local guy. He's on the side and he's kind of hanging out, and just it's probably his kids or whatever that are over there praying with somebody. So I just went over to, uh, you know, shoot the breeze and everything. And I'm talking to him a little bit. And I just, you know, said, hey, you know, <clears throat> we're, we're there to lead people to the Lord. So, hey, you know, so what'd you think about what Francis said? And, uh, and he's like, oh, okay, you know, and we're talking a little bit. So maybe this is your day. You know, maybe, uh, maybe this is your, your kids are receiving Christ. Maybe you need to receive Christ as well. You know, he can change your life. He changed my life. He goes, yeah, you don't know my life. I go, oh, you know, we're all pretty much the same. And now he's kind of giving me the, hey, yeah, but you're the holiday guy from Kailua kind of look, you know. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and, uh, and I, so I, 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 but I, but I know he doesn't know me, you know. So I start talking to him a little more. <clears throat> and I said, uh, no, God can change you. He totally changed me. Yeah, but you don't, you don't know me. I, I live on the beach over here. Well, that's okay. I used to live on the beach in Nauta Coolie. Where do you live? He used to live on the beach, yeah, in a tent for a long time, about, you know, this was like 30 years ago. You were homeless? Yeah, I was homeless. Like a hippie drippy, but I was homeless. But, uh, <clears throat> and I told him some of the other beaches I lived at out on the west side. He goes, wow. Then you kind of know what it's like. I, I kind of know what it's like. Yeah, but you don't know me because, you know, I got kind of a drug problem. I said, you don't know me because I had a big time drug problem. And it's one of the things that drove me to the Lord. I'm giving you the short version. And then he finally comes back. He thinks this is the deal breaker right here. He goes, yeah, but you don't know me. 
I'm not even living with my wife. That's my kids over there. I've been divorced one time. I mean, my life is a kind of a shambles. Oh, really? I've already been married, divorced twice, but I've been married for 30 years now because I'm telling you, Jesus Christ can transform your life. That's what I'm telling you. And it, it's kind of like that. I knew, I knew God had him at this point. It's like I knew he has, he has no more trump cards to throw on there. It's just like, I'm just like, so what do you got? What's holding you back? You want to be transformed? You want to be changed? You want to have your sins forgiven? Anyway, he prays with me to receive the Lord. But that's not self-righteousness. That's just sharing a righteousness you have in Jesus Christ. Nobody is above you. Nobody is below you. It's all the same at the foot of the cross. And I'll try to stop talking pigeon now. It's like, you know, I just, sorry, I just, I recall the scene as this kind of goes, goes back to that. But Joseph was a righteous man, but not a self-righteous man. He wasn't quick to judge. He wasn't quick to act. Paul, the apostle, put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. Now, you thought Popeye the sailor made that up. I am what I am. That's all that I am. I'm Popeye the sailor man. He took that from the apostle Paul <laughs> right here. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul could look at someone else who was... Uh, uh, in sin, doing horrible things, and say to them, there go I, but by the grace of God. Nobody was, was below him. He was a, a righteous man in Jesus Christ. That's the way Joseph is. So it's a difficult opportunity. We would say opportunity. Certainly he didn't see it at that point, but it would become because of his decision. His first decision is to put her away quietly because he loved her, and he's going to show mercy to her. But he needed some, we would say, divine clarification. And that's in verse 20 to 23. Again, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. Divine clarification. Notice verse 20, but while he thought about these things, again, speaking of the character of Joseph, it wasn't a knee-jerk knee reaction. It's like this is all happening, and it doesn't make sense based on his relationship with the Lord, based on his relationship with Mary, based on her character and the character of God. It doesn't make sense, so he just kind of takes, he, he just kind of steps back a little bit uh, and thinks about it. He doesn't rush to anything. Matthew Henry, the great Puritan preacher, says, It is the thoughtful, not the unthinking, that God will guide. It's good to dial it back a little bit when it seems like the wheels are coming off the cart and it doesn't make sense. It's not the way you planned it. Why is God allowing this to happen to me now? Well, it could be difficult, but it's probably a difficult opportunity if we'll see it from God's perspective. And that's what the angel is trying to do with him here. We know secondly about this divine clarification. Well, it explains that the birth is going to be miraculous. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. It wouldn't be the only time that would happen later with Joseph as the angel comes and warns him to flee Bethlehem and get to Egypt so that the life of the Messiah can be spared from the hand of Herod. But notice, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife. Again, what would be the fear? It would be... Well, it would be just their life would be greatly altered, a lot of harassment, and it would last throughout his life. It would last throughout the life of Mary. I mean, we know the rest of the story, but, but she does have this child, and it's before, you know, the, people can kind of count the dates from when they stood under the hoopah to the time the baby is born and kind of get, get the idea and do the math, and that stays with them. It stays with Jesus. The Pharisees confront him at a point in time in Jerusalem and say, we know about you. Whose father was you? Oh, that's right. We know the story about you in so many words. I mean, it never leaves him. Difficult opportunities. Are we afraid to take a stand for Jesus Christ? Even when we have divine clarification. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Just the simple fear of man can keep us from taking advantage of 
so many opportunities. Certainly the greatest opportunity is to come to faith in Jesus Christ, have our sins forgiven, and have the hope of heaven. Why would we allow what somebody else thinks about us to miss that opportunity? But the divine clarification, and I love this part, being a Bible teacher, it's supported by Scripture. Look at verse 22 again. So all these, this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is also translated God with us. The angel's quoting Isaiah 7.14. Matthew, of course, as the writer, wanting to make sure this is included to connect the Old Testament to, the, to the, the believers that are reading this, which are primarily Jewish at this point in time. Uh, the original quote by Isaiah is given in an interesting context. Ahaz is the king of Judea. He's being attacked and going to be surrounded by a very powerful Syrian army along with the northern kingdom of Israel that is coming uh, against them. He's worried about the Davidic line, the lineage of David. Would it continue on? Because it would be through David and one of his messiahs that the whole world would be blessed. There would always be a Davidic king on the throne if the people followed God's commands. What's going to happen if he is killed uh, in the, as the city is surrounded? Isaiah the prophet says, you don't have to worry about the Davidic lineage carrying on. In fact, here's the sign to show you that it's going to happen. In the future, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And here it is, the fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14. Again, Matthew writing to his audience that knows the Old Testament, 50 times he will quote from it, 76 more times he will allude to it, and other examples of things he'll mention about the Messiah predicted in the Old Testament, he'll be born of a virgin from the tribe of Judah, betrayed by a friend, given vinegar to drink on the cross. He would rise again. He would be spat upon. Soldiers would gamble for his clothes. In his death, not one of his bones would be broken, but he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. He would be accused by false witnesses. His hands and his feet would be pierced. And we could go on and on and on kind of eliminates that chance possibility that he's not the guy. I mean, as it goes on and on and on, uh, only Jesus could have been the Messiah. Joseph would have certainly, again, struggled with this idea. It's one thing, okay, the Holy Spirit somehow is going to bring about a child, and he's the Messiah, but uh, what else? Well, it's not just that. He's the Son of God. Wow. <laughs> The Messiah, you're going to have the Messiah. Hey, every young girl in Israel dreams of having the Messiah. They've all been waiting it, and they all have Messianic expectations. They, this is like the ultimate thing. You're going to have the Messiah who's going to drive out the Romans and reestablish Israel and bring it into its glory and its kingdom once again. The Messiah is going to come. Ah, but now they've got a little curveball thrown, and he's going to be God come in the flesh, the Son of God. Well, that was also predicted by Isaiah the prophet. Chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful. And, uh, that, you know, this isn't like, like wonderful as in, that's, that's a wonderful view you have, or wonderful like that was a wonderful meal we had, all those tamales here yesterday, if you missed out on that. That was wonderful. That's not the word that's here in the Hebrew. This means it's, it's above my thinking. I can't comprehend it. When we say that of Jesus and we sing that song, his name is wonderful, it means he's so far above me, I can't really comprehend him. He's the counselor. He's the one that has every answer. He's mighty God. Again, the point of what the angel says both to Joseph and to Mary. He's the everlasting father. He is not God the father, but he is unchanging like God the father in terms of character. And he is the prince of peace. Only he can bring peace to a person's heart. That was all predicted. It was anticipated. It's now said to Mary. Mary conveys that to Joseph it was just a lot to take in for him. But the angel is giving him clarification. Messiah was to be virgin born. Isaiah didn't just prophesy it. So did Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 22. How long will you gad about? 
It's an interesting word. I'll try to work that into my vocabulary, but it means to wander about. Maybe that's kind of a shopping phrase. How long will we get about Ella Moana today, honey? What do you think? <laughs> but uh, wander about, oh, you backsliding daughter. For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. Hasn't happened before. A woman shall encompass a man. A woman on her own alone shall give birth to a man. And, uh, and so the virgin birth predicted. The Messiah would come. He would be virgin born. He would be the son of God. And Joseph's got to take it all in. How does the angel calm his fears and bring clarification? Again, he quotes scripture. If an angel shows up to you in one of your dreams, he's not quoting the Bible, I would say you probably shouldn't listen to him. I, again, supernatural things are just that. They're supernatural things. There's the good guys and the bad guys. Uh, in terms of your dream life, things that can happen, coincidences, the real confirmation to him comes, I believe, because he's a, he's a man of the word, is that the angel is able to quote scripture and show him through the word Hey, you can trust Mary. Uh, this is God behind all of this. So he's confronted with the difficult, we would say, opportunity. Decides to quietly divorce her. But hey, divine clarification from a, in a dream, but the confirmation is based on the word of God. And the fourth thing is Joseph determines to trust God's plan. Verse 24, 25, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So he determines to trust Mary because, again, they stand under the hoopah. They become man and wife, uh, as, uh, as the angel has said. And apparently he does it right away. Being aroused from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And then he also determines to trust God by giving him not just any name or family name, but uh, this name, Jesus, a common name, but again, means God is salvation. And salvation would certainly come from Jesus. The last thing here is Joseph's dilemma was part of God's plan of salvation. Joseph had to trust in the Son of God to save him from his sins, like everybody else. Notice verse 21. And she will bring forth a son... And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Yeah, he was, a, he was a living to a righteous standard, doing his best to follow the law of God. But Isaiah had already said to every person at that time, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord will lay on him, on Jesus, the iniquities of us, not most of us, of us all. The Apostle Paul put it this way, that um, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some people, based on church tradition and things of God, actually teach that, that Mary was sinless. But Mary herself says she needs a Savior. Joseph himself is instructed he's going to die for the sins of the whole world. Every person has got a sin issue. Every person needs to have their uh, their, their sins are forgiven. Uh, and though there might be other world religious figures that are out there, there might be other teaching that are out there that has some aspect that, uh, of truth to it or is interesting or can help a person, none of them deal with the sin issue that separates us from God. Only Jesus Christ does. People can trust in a lot of different things, but Peter, when he gets up to preach on the day of Pentecost, says, there is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. It's a, it's a very inclusive claim that Jesus makes of himself, that the Bible makes. We're simply the, the messengers of that claim, but the invitation, well, we celebrate it at this time of year. We would say the invitation went out 2,000 years ago uh, at at Bethlehem. But of course, as the kids pointed out in their play, it doesn't end there. Jesus must then live a perfect sinless life and go to that cross and pay for it. It's kind of encapsulated in a great little quote I want to read from you by a guy named Lee Bishop. He was an army doc in Afghanistan. He's in uh, Bagram. Uh, this is in an article in 09, so obviously at least the, the year prior. He's writing and reflecting on Christmas Eve, some of the sights, some of the sounds in the article, which includes, 
which includes some flag draped coffins, but also some singing and some rejoicing that's taking place all over the camp. Uh, and he, at the end of the article, uh, he writes this about Jesus. In his coming, he brought joy and peace, the joy that overcomes our sorrows. And the only kind of peace that ultimately matters is the peace of which the end of all wars, terrible as they are, is merely one token. It's the peace that means the long war between the heart and its maker is over. It's a peace treaty offered in Bethlehem and signed in blood on Calvary. Great line. It begins here, but uh, the opportunity, the extension, the invitation to have a relationship with God, to have your sins forgiven, to know that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, it begins at his birth, but... Uh, a peace treaty has got to be signed. And this one was signed in the blood of Jesus Christ as he dies on the cross for our sins. And of course, the story does not end. He rises again three days later as he predicted to give evidence that that offering was accepted to give evidence to the fact that everything he claimed was absolutely true. We, we say of Christianity that it is evidential by its very nature. We say that it's a reasonable step into the light, not a leap into the dark. And, uh, and certainly as we look at Christmas and we celebrate the birth of Christ, and again, I'm thankful that all these non-Christians that are out there celebrating a Christian holiday, you know, it's like, I don't know how much longer this is going to go on. There wasn't the gifts involved in some of the other stuff. I'm not sure uh, that uh, this would all still be happening, you know, but uh, there's a lot of people actually trying to fight against that. But, uh, man, we can rejoice the fact that we can, at this time of year, not that Jesus was actually born on December 25th, but we have the opportunity to celebrate the fact that God left heaven and came and dwelt among us. And it all begins in an animal shelter. It all begins in one of the most unlikely places uh, you, could, you could ever imagine. Uh, Bruce Thiel uh, th uh, Thielman wrote an article a number of years ago called Hark the Herald Angels. And he was talking about one of the most horrible times in world history uh, in terms of the uh, Nazism through, uh, through Europe, through Western and Eastern Europe, and the occupation of Poland. He, he talks about the, uh, the fact that there was a, an older man walking through a, a Jewish cemetery very early in the morning. And he comes upon a, a grave that's been dug out, and in that grave had stumbled a woman in the night or actually maybe crawled into it, hide there so that she can deliver her baby. He stumbles across it. The baby is alive. The woman has now died. He says he found the child, and he said to himself and to others, this must be the Messiah, for only the Messiah could choose to be born in a grave. Well, it wasn't the Messiah. The child died before noon that day. But the truth of that cemetery keeper spoke is absolutely accurate. Only the Messiah of God could choose to be born in a grave. Only a God who loves as our God loves could come in the midst of all the pain of life and death and bring us peace. Only God could choose to be born in an animal shelter uh, in the lowest of low place that he would have access to everyone, that everyone would be able to come through him. Again, the wise men come. Where do they come? They expect, well, the capital, the palace, but he's not there. He's in the city of David. All the prophecies are fulfilled, but uh, in a place that we would never imagine God would come when he invades this world, but he chooses to do it, fulfills prophecy again, and lives that life so that you and I might have that well, sign that peace treaty with him. Maybe if you haven't done that before or you're unsure, you can simply do that by praying a simple prayer, inviting Christ into your heart, asking him to forgive you of any sins that you might have. If you're not sure, that just means you're not perfect. If you're not sure if you're perfect, ask the person next to you. They'll give you a little clue. You're not perfect. I don't know why this sin thing is such an issue. We've all done wrong things. Jesus said, if you've even thought it, it's like you've done it. That pretty much uh, is the icing on the cake. We all need the Lord. We all need our sins forgiven. And we all need the hope of heaven uh, in this life and the transformation. I don't know what your story is. 
I don't know if you got the past I got. I don't know what the issues are you think you've got that would keep you from coming to faith in Christ. But uh, as I shared with that guy in Waianae, it was like he had no more cards left, and he was and he was ready. I don't know if you're ready this morning. Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error binding till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for young. A new and glorious morn Fall on your knees Oh, hear the angel voices A night was born oh,
on a good 